you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet, I'm glad to tell you that we've got a sponsor for this video and I wish to thank the sponsor for keeping the legacy dream alive and supporting the legacy which we're creating here for the South African Security Forces. And if any of you watching here wish to advertise on Legacy, just contact me. But for now, let us see what our sponsor has to say and let us support our sponsor as well. Thank you. OTT Technologies is a global leader in the design, development, manufacturing, delivery and logistical support of protected vehicles. Established in 1980 in South Africa, we have built and supplied hundreds of specialized and remanufactured vehicles to UN-sanctioned peacekeeping missions, NGOs, contractors and governments. This includes support vehicles, mine-protected APCs and specialized police and military vehicles, all manufactured in our facilities in South Africa and in the United States. Our in-house engineering development and design division ensures that we aren't reliant on third parties or independent contractors and gives us the ability to react quickly and efficiently to our customers' requirements. Our vehicles are tested in controlled and real-life battle conditions and protection claims are corroborated by independent third-party certifications. In an effort to expand an already lucrative menu of products and services, OTT acquired LMT Products and ADG Mobility to add new dimension to its already formidable offerings. LMT provides additional products and capabilities, and ADGM brings a class-leading capability in design and protection, specifically flat bottom mine protection. We offer global after-sales service, training and product support to our clients. Integrated lifecycle support and product lifecycle support is an integral part of our product support service and commitment to our customers. This can be tailored according to the need and requirement of each client. Commissioning of the vehicles and sign-over takes place at a location as prescribed by the client. The vehicles will be inspected and tested to ensure no transport damages. We ensure no longer available parts or NLA is supported and available by dedicated procurement members. The integrated parts catalog is provided to the client to order spares. We offer basic driver training, difficult terrain driving training or advanced drivers, maintenance training and logistics training. In order to receive a competence certificate, trainees must pass various theoretical and practical assessments. Our technicians can be deployed to assist our clients with maintenance, repair and in-service training. We offer technical and maintenance support for up to one year or periodic support as required. During the warranty period, our specialists will assist clients with suitable solutions and clients use the feedback and failure report system. Our mobile workshop repair system is just one module of an entire system designed to support OTT's products in the field. The workshop is equipped with high-quality tools and machinery that provides for easy and user-friendly repair in the field. OTT enjoys a world-renowned reputation of excellence and battle-proven products that operate throughout the world. Hello Internet, we are back and we've got Gregory Ashton here with us. You will remember this fellow, he was at Ops Firework, one of the greatest episodes ever made. On Legacy, not my opinion, well actually is my opinion, but a lot of other people uh, said that as well. And uh, Greg, thank you for coming back, we really appreciate it. I'm sorry it took so long for me to get to you and Daryl, we will get to Daryl as well. He was also at Ops Firework. Uh, participant. Uh, we know that you, when you were speaking about Ops Firewood, were in Tureti, 
After that, we got out of your uh, second in command, Colonel Stanley F. Potter. Wonderful one, that as well, through you. Thank you for that. But now we're going to talk about your military career for you as a man, as a soldier. I know you started off, I think, in the infantry, when you went to the Parabats, from there you went to one Reiki. You ended up in two Reiki after being... Well, we'll get to that. <laughs> we'll get to that, why that happened. Uh, that's university, things like that. I'm great sympathy with you. Thank you for being here. Welcome. And it's over to you. Where do you come from? What happened to you? Chris, thanks very much. Um, it's an honor to be here and um, just to talk to some people. You know, today things are somewhat different to when we were young. Um, and I was talking to someone the other day just with regard to growing up. Um, and they were saying, what did you watch on TV? Well, we didn't have TV in those days. Now, I'm not that old, you know, but it's just sort of one of those things. And I suppose it has a lot to do with where one uh, grows up and in what era. But I still see that there are a lot of people today who live exactly the same way. And it comes down to your value system. Um, I was born in Johannesburg. Um, and in fact, it's funny, after... Close on 60 years, I've done a full circle and I stay about three kilometers from where my parents' house was in Johannesburg. Um, so I was born, my father is of Irish descent, um, Irish and a little bit of local South African English descent, but primarily Irish. And my mother is of Dutch and French Huguenot descent. So in in essence, my ancestry is more European, so it's Irish and Dutch. Um, anyway, being born here in Johannesburg at the age of four, my father and mother decided to go and farm in the old Eastern Transvaal, which is now in Pumalanga. They had a banana farm there, and they'd been managing it from here, and they decided to sell up everything and go down there. And I think it was for the benefit of us as children, uh, the three of us, uh, older brother, myself, and the younger sister. And we moved down in the um, early 60s. And uh, I was too young to go to school. Um, so I was really um, a farm kid growing up on the farm. Now, strange enough, my mother's first language was Zulu. Um, because of where she grew up, and she was what they would call the Lat Lamaki. She was born 25 years after her other sister, uh, prior to her. And so she spoke English, uh, she spoke Zulu as a first uh, language. Later on, she learned English when she went to school, only later. And thirdly, she learned Afrikaans, which was actually supposed to be in her home language. And growing up in the Pumalanga region, they speak Siswati uh, or Shangan, uh, which are all derivatives of Zulu. So um, I learned to speak the language pretty well. Uh, and, and I really enjoyed it. Um, I had one of those childhoods that a lot of young boys dream of. Um, ran, I ran around in a bear shoe. Now, if somebody doesn't know what a bear shoe is, a bear shoe is a loincloth. It's made of skin. Um, and you used to herd the cattle with the guys on the farm. Um, a lot of the farm was wild. We had a section of the farm that was totally wild, and we often had leopard um, <laughs> and bush pig and buck and things like that. So we had to be pretty careful about it. But, you know, went to uh, did the things in. I would say went to school. Um, that was a good part of my upbringing. So you learned a lot about the bush. Come school time, I went to a local school. I was the only English-speaking kid. 101 kids, and I was number 101, and learned to speak Afrikaans because I had to. It's a of bars, you know. Either, either you learn or you die. And uh, it was very quick. Uh, in terms of learning, I think when you're that young, uh, between five and six, you adapt to the language quite easily. And soon Afrikaans was actually better than my English. Anyway, that's the way it went. So I went through a little school there, got bullied a lot by the local kids because I was the Engelsman, an Englishman, little knowing that I, in fact, none of my family, my forefathers, loved the English. Uh, on my father's side, my great-grandfather had fled Ireland because he had a price in those days on his head, a reward for 20,000 pounds, which is mostly 10 hundred million gazillion rand today. And um, on my mother's side, 
her grandfather was shot in the 1914 rebellion for refusing to fight for the uh, Union against uh, the Germans. So nobody really liked the English. And I knew that, uh, but only later on in life. And the strange thing was it came back to haunt me many, many years later, which I'll touch on. Anyway, so I went to a little school, which is called Kippersall Primary, from there to White River Primary. And if ever any of you have read that book, The Power of One, where the guy gets bullied at school and uh, he eventually learns to sort things out himself, yeah, I went through that. I thought the book had been written about me to some extent. I'm not being pig-headed, but it's just one of those things that happened. Anyway, so uh, then I went to Lovell High in Nelspreit, where I matriculated. Um, but I got my call-up papers whilst there. And as Chris had uh, touched on previously, I got called up to one of the infantry regiments in 1977, uh, which was FORSI, for South African Infantry Regiment or Battalion in uh, Middleburg. I detested it. I think it was the adjustment from being a schoolboy and going into something like that, but it really was one of those places you just don't want to be. And I thought anything, I'll get out of here. I'll even become a chef in some other regiment or anything like that. But I remember somebody saying, never volunteer when you're in the army, but try and improve yourself and give yourself another uh, chance to do something else. The first guys who came along were the guys from Parachute Battalion. And I did the selection uh, there where they do, you have to do push-ups and sit-ups and run. And eventually when the guy stopped me at about 212 sit-ups, he said, you can stop now. Um, I realized that I was fit enough and I could make it. I ended up going to uh, Parish Battalion in Bloemfontein. I did my basics. Um, I really enjoyed it there. And um, we started off with the two-week uh, PD course, which is your precursor to your jumping course. And in week number two on the Wednesday, some other guys happened to come around uh, to come and recruit. And these were the guys from Reconnaissance Regiment or the Reckies, as they were known. So we were all called down to the sort of entertainment area outside the camp where they had movies and and the pub and, and so on called Rondis. And um, they showed us a recruitment video and I was very impressed because one of those videos, which was very gung-ho, but appealed to your heartstrings. And um, of the guys who went down, there must have been about 50 or 60 of us. We had to do some more tests, which is running and whatever. And I'll be past that. And I thought, great, uh, that'd be the next step. They said, no, wait, boys, you're going to have to wait for about a week before the train comes to collect you. So you're going to have to wait. So we went back with the group now to continue with our PD course. And the guy said, uh -uh, uh, you guys are betraying us. You think you can carry the PD course? He said, no, no way, Jose, you're going to go elsewhere. So we had to sit, sit in the bungalow and wait. And uh, while the guys then finished the PD course and went on to the jumping course the following week, uh, we were shipped out. And um, we were then uh, sent off to Potterstrom, where they were doing the pre-training area or pre-training course with a pre-selection. And Potch was uh, three SAI or three South African Infantry Regiment or Battalion. And um, we had the, the instructors from one reconnaissance regiment. In those days, it was actually called Reconnaissance Commando. It was the very early days of this. It only changed later. Um, I, I stand corrected. And uh, so we did the pre-selection course, but part of that at that stage was also to finish off your, your basic training um, that you have to do as an infantry soldier. So we went through that, and that was cut insurgency, bush, bush uh, warfare, etc. When it came to the actual selection, um, we had to go off to Pretoria before we actually did the actual selection course to go to the Military Medical Institute. And there they do psychological evaluation and a medical evaluation and I suppose any other evaluation that they can assess whether you'd be suitable or at all or not. And um, they don't tell you what the results are, but you come back and I was turned down medically, but they wouldn't tell me why. I used, used to wear glasses in those days because I was a bit short-sighted and thanks to my mom for that. And um, anyway, so they just said you turn down medically and you're going to be returned to units, but they don't return you to the unit that you came from. They just find a gap and they sent me off to Kimberley. To cut the long story short, I was very unhappy there. Didn't want to do 
um, conventional infantry stuff. Not that I thought I was above everybody else, but I just thought, you know, there's more to it than this, you know, and this is, this is a whole lot more. And um, another guy called Rick Fandaro and I, who'd both been turned down, he was deaf in the one ear. Um, they didn't like the fact that he was deaf because they said, no, you'd be, um, what's the word when you, you are a burden to other people. Uh, a liability is the word I was thinking of. You would become a liability to other people in a military context and they couldn't use you. So that was him. For me, I didn't know what the reason was. So we decided we're going to go to the equestrian uh, center. So the the defense force had quite a strong infantry wing, which was, I think, molded on the Gray Scouts of Rhodesia, uh, based on horseback, and they did a lot of uh, good work in the bush. And when it came to a testing, because now the only way to get there was to sign up permanent force, I didn't have any greater plans at that stage. I thought I was going to do this. And when it came to actually signing up, the guy said, are you sure that's what you want to do? And I said, no, that's not what I want to do. He said, what, what is it? You've come this whole way to do this. I told him, I said, I want to go to reconnaissance regiment or reconnaissance commando, um, but I've been turned down medically. I still like to go, even if in a support role or to do whatever I could to be there, because I felt I would be a better fit. I had to go off to go and see the general officer commanding of special forces who was based the defense force headquarters in those days. Um, and um, so they said, you're going to have to go and see him because you have to get his approval. And um, so I went through to the defense force headquarter buildings and they're these massive triple story buildings i think old victorian style buildings and i sat outside this office and i waited and i waited and i waited three days later and um i didn't see anybody that i needed to see i i, I was expecting a general because this is who it was and uh, there were people going in and out and as a young recruit i just stood up and saluted and sat down and stood up and saluted and sat down this is all i did for three days but what I did see, there was an old gentleman in a black suit, looked a bit like Colonel Harlan Sanders from KFC, you know, white beard and a little bit of a goatee. And um, he um, he was in and out and in and out and so on. And I thought, well, he's an assistant or something like that. Anyway, cut the long story short. The third day, he said, they said, Butman, in other words, listen, young man, come inside. I'm, uh, I believe um, you need to talk to somebody. So I got up and I followed through and I went through into this enormous boardroom area, walked through it, um, but plush leather couches, these Winston style couches. There was a big desk at the back there and he had papers under his arm. And I thought, well, he's just setting it up like this. So he sat down, he said, sit here. And he walked down to the desk and sat down on the other side. And I thought, oh, he's only preparing things up. He says, um, I'm General Kurs Lurt. I'm General Lurt, not Kurs Lurt, General Lurt. And I looked at him. I thought, this can't be the general. He said, yep, I know all about you. I opened up my file, told me exactly what was what the reason was why I'd been rejected. I was short-sighted and they felt that I couldn't do it if I lost my glasses in operational circumstances, should I pass selection. Um, but they could send me down um, in a support capacity. And if that's really what I wanted, he would do that because they needed men like me. I thought, cool, that's going to be really nice. Uh, but I told, he said, and you've been waiting here for three days. Yes, I said. And how long did it take you to get you? I said, three months. I said, I've been trying to get you. So he said, you determined. I said, yes. They sent me down on the train to Durban. And I got there. And then the officer commanding at One Recce was uh, uh, Major John Moore. And he took me into his office. And he said to me, why you are here? And I explained to him, he said, um, so you want to be support personnel, do you? I said, no, I don't. I actually would like to become an operator, but I've been turned down medically. He said, repeating the same thing that General Lurtz had said, so you really determined? Yes, I said. So I, he said, I'll tell you what, the select selection course is about to start in the, in the next three months, but the guys that you on course on, who were on course with who passed selection are here. They're busy doing their basic uh, special forces uh, cycle and some of the courses. So they, we're going to put you on that course 
uh, or on the cycle and you can do things with them. So you're going to do demolitions. You're going to do the medical, basic medical course, foreign weapons, uh, communications, all of those things that you need to do. We will take you through your driver's course, everything, so that you learn to do those things. But the requirement is we want a 95% pass from you because you haven't passed selection, but you need to prove it to everybody else. Well, I did it with a few of the other guys, much to the disdain of some of the people who already had passed. And um, three months down the line, the next selection group came through and I joined up with them. Now, in Bloemfontein, I mentioned I was on the PT course. Now, Bloemfontein is a high altitude. It's a lot drier. And yes, the summers do get hot, but it's not like Durban. Durban is um, like a muggy old sock that's been worn for three months. It smells, it stinks, and it's very humid, particularly in summer. In November, 77, we started off with our PT course. And there were 861 guys who started on the initial selection course. Of course, this is going through MMI, the Military Medical Institute, and people being kicked off uh, because they didn't meet the requirements. And then the group that arrived in Durban to do the PT course. And I think at that stage, there were about 250 of them. Um, people were sleeping everywhere because the base was too small to accommodate it, accommodate such a large uh, number of people. By the end of the two-week PT course, we were down to 48. Um, we passed the test that we had to do, the same as if we were at Bloemfontein at Parachute Battalion. And from there, we then went to Bloemfontein. We did our jumping course. And funny, one of the guys who kicked me off the course was there before. And I said, yeah, I said I'll be back. Anyway, so it was, it was great. One of the other things that was quite unique about our course, we had the first two Bushman uh, soldiers from uh, the Bushman Battalion. Uh, who came down and they did the jumping course with us. They didn't do the PD course. I think these guys are fit enough to do it, but they did the jumping course with us. And at the end of the jumping course, we went and did our selection and we did in the Caprivi. And after we'd finished the, the selection course, there were only 10 of us who passed. So from 861 down to 10, uh, that's quite, quite uh, significant. Not that I'm patting my myself on the shoulders for that. I think you need your head read at times. Uh, people ask me, would I do it all again? No, I wouldn't. Would I exchange it? No, I wouldn't either. I, I just think you've, when you're young, you fertile ground for uh, planting a seed of enthusiasm. Um, I certainly was a strong nationalist. I, ble I believed in the country and what you were doing. And I was the right type of candidate I think that they needed. So going through, we did the rest of the uh, cycle that we had to do, um, which takes you through all the various courses, including bushcraft, tracking, and survival, which is the best holiday ever. I lived like a king in there, and that's because I grew up in the bush. I mean, the first thing I caught, people say, well, what did you catch? You know, did you catch Franklin or guinea fowl or something like that? No, I caught my instructor. I had a whip snare set up, and I caught him on by his legs and whipped him up into the air. Um, I wasn't very popular, but hey, it's one of those things. After the uh, selection, after the uh, bushcraft tracking survival course, we rounded that off with the final uh, course that you need to do, and that's called Minor Tactics. And Minor Tactics teaches you the finer detail of uh, counterinsurgency, but from a special forces perspective. And it's drill, 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 and do it over and over and over again. Um, our instructor for the course was Captain Hannes Fenter, who was also my selection course instructor. And Hannes took no prisoners, and neither did the instructors that worked for him. And he was really tough. And I know why he was tough, because, you know, you don't get a second chance when you're in the bush, when you're in a war um, environment, you walk into contact. If you're not better than the opposition and the enemy, um, you are going to suffer as a result of that. And he was strict on us. We lived in the bush. We ate in the bush. Uh, we became the bush in many ways. Um, and was really uh, worthwhile. That's about a three month course. By the time that you finished there, you lean and mean. And the final uh, part of that is to then go on an operation because the other um, operators with whom you'd be working would be the guys who then say, yes, you're good enough or no, you're not good enough. Because remember, it's teamwork. Um, it's great to be an individual. Everybody thinks, hey, I'm Rambo and I can do whatever I want to. No, uh, you rely on your team members and you're there to support them. And if you understand that process um, and you work around that day on 
day on and day on, you will understand eventually that your team means everything for you and means everything to you. So we did a few uh, smaller operations. Um, I was also then seconded with some of the senior operators. We worked with Chief of Staff Intelligence um, with UNITA in the southern part of Angola, uh, training them to become better soldiers. We did one or two base attacks with them um, and then came back. Um, and this happened because I'd done a lot of my other courses before everybody else in my group. So I was a bit more um, advanced in terms of the, the courses I'd done to qualify. Um, so there wasn't really anything for me to do. So they, so they thought, let's utilize you and put you into, the, into a combat situation. And I really appreciated that. I think one of the other things too is respecting those who have gone before you. And I'm not talking those who have passed, uh, but I'm talking those who have earned their stripes, those who have become hardened soldiers um, and have learned from others as well. And the best thing to do is if you've got one or two of those more seasonal, more seasoned soldiers, they take you under their wing. Um, and that's terrific. So shortly thereafter, um, we got told we had to get into Dakota and we're going to be flying north and they didn't want to tell us what it was about. And um, we flew at treetop height uh, from Pretoria, went north and we thought we're going to the Caprivi and uh, which is then Southwest Africa and it wasn't to be the case. Um, reconnaissance command at that stage was split into two uh, groups. One was Alpha Group and one was Bravo. Um, and what one group did, the other group was maybe aware of, but they didn't share that. So we knew that Alpha Group had been doing something, but we weren't sure what it was. And being in Bava Group, we were then sent up to what was then Rhodesia. Uh, we flew in low um, over the Matapos and we stopped, uh, landed at a place called Mabalauta, which was going to be our home for the next uh, few months. Um, it was on the main, one of the main infiltration routes um, for the Zanla. Um, terrorists coming in from Mozambique into Rhodesia on the Nuanetsi River, and this is where we're going to be based. Um, we then became D Squadron SAS. There were a lot of other members of the SAS that were there, which we had dealings with, but we didn't uh, operate in the same groups as they did. There were a lot of them there at that stage that were busy recuperating from some big operations that they'd been in. Um, and they rather used them in a support capacity in the bush where they were busy recuperating rather than keeping them at the base, uh, which was a good thing. Um, and from there, we started doing a number of operations into what was called the Russian Front. Now, the Russian Front is the western part of the Mozambique provinces, which is on the eastern highlands of Mozambique, uh, Mozambique, Rhodesia. And we would either walk in, we'd, we'd go through the, they'd be driven to the border area and go in via where the landmines were, and the engineers would take, or the sappers would take us through the landmines, and then we'd walk into where we were going to um, be active, or they'd drop us in by parachute um, at nighttime. Um, it's a very mountainous area, and um, it was, um, it was one of those, one of those periods we think, I really don't want to ever do this again, but I can tell you one thing from uh, a young soldier's perspective, where you've got senior guys around you who have years of experience, it's the best training ground ever. Um, we saw groups coming in and going out. Um, they'd be dropped in by parachute and picked up by helicopter after the operation. Um, and they used to tell us hair raising stories. And then when we went in, yeah, the hair-raising stories just seem to be bigger every time. But I think it's because you you experiencing that. And it was anything from ambushes to walking patrol to base attacks and things like that. This is what we did. Uh, towards the end of our stay and, um, I would say, contract with uh, the Rhodesian Army and um, with the SAS, uh, we did a big operation uh, as part of a, a coordinated attack with the Air Force. Uh, one of the para wings of the um, RLI, the Sulu Scouts, and then of obviously two um, squadrons of the SAS. And we did a, bit, a big attack. 
Um, it was called Operation Uric or Bootlace, depending on, on which side it was. Uh, it was supposed to be one of those operations where you jump in the morning by parachute because it's been bombed, you drop, you fan out, you become stopper, stopper groups for any of the tours that are escaping, and um, you mop up, and then at sunset you go home and go and have a beer and a steak. Well, it didn't turn out that way. It turned out to be uh, a bit longer than that. We suffered a uh, casualty on our side. Uh, Mac van der was shot in the side of the neck during one of the base attacks that we uh, did. Um, and when I say base attacks, there were three or four bases in the area that we went into. Um, so that was very sad. But the operation itself was, was successful. It was successful. But I think from a learning perspective, for me, it was one of the big turns in my life. I mean, we came up against tanks. We came up against a lot of armed insurgents that we were dealing with. I think we, in total, we were something like 65, and I'm taking all of us together. And I think there were between three and four and a half thousand tours in that camp. You know, you don't know that, uh, but you've got, yes, you've got the Air Force on your side, but the Air Force wasn't big. I mean, they had a few Hunter bombers which came in. They had a Lynx, which is a, a push pull. Uh, Cessna um, with little napalm bombs that used to drop. That was all. Then we it was us on the ground against them, and they had BTRs and they had uh, T sixty four and T seventy two tanks and so on. We didn't have much else. I just think we were gung ho and we were ready to do that. And I remember being airlifted out on the uh, end of the second day, blackened faces because the base had burnt down. We had had no water and food for two days. Um, and being part of the uh, Rhodesian army at that stage, when they flew us out, it was like a scene from that movie Apocalypse Now. We got all of those helicopters and just amazing. The sun was busy setting and it's sort of late afternoon, it's this red winter sun and just an amazing feeling. Um, the only thing missing was the that music they played on the speakers, the, the ride of the Valkyries. Okay, I'm, I'm saying in jest, but that's how it felt. It was an incredible feeling. And when we landed just above um, the mountains in Umtali, uh, there were big farm areas there, and the farmers are obviously very supportive of this. When we landed, we were told to go and get milk and food and things like that. And I just remember going through, and General Walls, who was head of the army at that stage, he was commander in chief. He was there busy handing out, handing out stuff, uh, food and drink and things like that. I mean, I'd never seen that type of support before. None of our guys either. And I mean, and the support we got from, from the locals is just unbelievable. Anyway, that was the end of uh, the Rhodesian War because we came back shortly thereafter because of the Lancaster House discussions. And then that was when the new government took over in Rhodesia. So um, shortly thereafter, um, in terms of participating in operations, we'd had we'd had quite a bit that was going on. Um, I had a great team leader, uh, young Lieutenant by the name of Mark Natolovitz. And um, he, not because he was English speaking either like it, but just, I suppose, with the sense of humor. And I, and I did find initially that, that, you know, things are different. You get some, and especially when you're younger, you get a lot of guys who are very gung-ho and the military reason and, and purpose for being there is very much focused that way or that way. And I was actually enjoying the trip, if you want to use that expression. And um, we'd been doing some small basic operations where, as a team, we were working better. And our team and our side was uh, a team of six people. So you got your, your team leader, you got a 2IC, and then you got the rest of you, and you'd start working together as a team and molding together. And we started working well. And we had an, the call to go and do or participate in a bigger operation, but we weren't told what it was. And we had to start preparing um, in Durban uh, for the op that was coming up. We were getting things together like uh, scaffolding and training at night during the when it was raining and always at nighttime, always at nighttime. We were going to visit tunnels and things like that. We thought, hmm, we got something coming up. So the operation that came up was called Operation Backlash. And we must have done a good two, maybe three months of preparation, 
different charges that we were working with in terms of explosives, um, how to uh, target tunnels, et cetera, et cetera. And um, the operation became bigger than just our team. There were a number of teams that were uh, put together. So I think there were in total, there were about uh, 18 of us that were put together. Um, plus some other support elements from guys from Five Ricky that were there and a number of other components as well. And the operation took place out of Ondongwa in uh, then uh, Southwest Africa, which is now Namibia. And we were uh, selected to attack one of the main lines of communication um, in Angola. It's a railway line going from the west to the east, which took all of their um, armaments and food and whatever supplies were needed by train to the operational area where they were working in Mosamedes, not Mosamedes, in more towards the east. And um, we had to go and blow up the tunnel. And uh, it was very, the operation was successful. It was high up in the mountains and we flew in um, and we did what we had to do at night, blew up the tunnel. The whole tunnel didn't uh, sag in because it's a mountain and mountain rock um, where you know you can't get it all to blow with the small charges or percentage of charges you're going to be using um, but we were successful in blowing it up to such a degree that they could not use that tunnel for quite a few years before they were able to um, either build around it or to uh, clear it again which was the latter option which they chose so um, that's what happened in that case um, it was a great operation to participate in, um, one of the very, very few successful type of special forces operations. Um, and I need to commend Mark for his leadership in something in, in an operation of this nature. Um, you need a guy who's cool headed, knows what needs to be done. And, you know, none of the guys are like school kids, you know, they sometimes troublesome and to try and keep them all in and get them focused and to do what they need to do. It's, it's an important thing. And Mark just had that knack. And for me, it was a really great experience to be part of that team. Um, after that, we participated in an operation called Amazon. Now, Amazon was a precursor for a very famous uh, operation um, that the Special Forces participated in on the west coast of Angola called Kaslich, uh, or Candlelight where there were quite a number of casualties, but also it was a success in terms of what needed to be done. But our operation was a precursor to this. Uh, it wasn't just testing, but I think in a way it did. We were taken up with the Navy and um, we had to go in and go and blow up some of the oil tanks um, and various other components in the harbor. Uh, it was Lubito Harbor, it wasn't um, further up uh, in, in the capital of Luanda. Uh, but this is where a lot of the ships came in and brought all the supplies and armaments to, and they went through the tunnel, in fact, that we'd just blown up uh, previously. So part of the strategy behind all of this was to blow up all of the, and damage all of the lines of communication and support. And if you prevent the enemy from getting their supplies, um, you weaken them and you weaken their resolve because uh, an army without ammunition, without food, without supplies uh, becomes demoralized. And that was the whole idea behind that. Um, the operation was successful. Um, and it's funny, when you're operating right under the enemy's nose at nighttime, yes, you are wearing the uniform and so on. But when guys walk past you close by and they don't even realize that you are the enemy and you're there to blow up, you know, oil tankers, um, the oil tanks and, and so on in, in the harbor area. And you walk out and you're able to get, when I say walk out, you leave, we want Zodiacs and you're going out to sea. I remember when the um, explosions uh, took place, when the charges were detonated, just this amazing orange sky. Um, but the thing that struck me more, as we're doing that, some Cape Dusky Dolphins came out of the sea and were as we were going out in the water, they were alongside us doing this like it, just one of those magic moments. One of the not so magic moments, the sea had been very rough and was a four to five day trip uh, from Longaban, which is where Four Ricky's base is on the west coast um, of South Africa. Going north was four to five days and the sea was very rough and I was seasick for the four to five days. Um, when you cannot even keep down a glass of water, you cannot keep anything down. I was 
miserable. And I couldn't wait to get onto the Zodiac and go and take part in the operation. Coming back, we were all euphoric and so on. We got on board and guess what? Another four to five days of hell going back again. And I lost 18 pounds, I remember, in that. So 18 pounds is what? About eight kilograms just in those few days like that. Um, but that was a good, uh, that was a, 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 a successful operation. And I still remember because of the press and so on, we had to be isolated um, in Longaban at the military base for quite a few days because it was all in the press and everything was happening. So, you know, keep a lid on it and, and keep us there. Um, I had planned at that stage to go to university and I thought I would end my military career at that stage. So I'd been in there from 77 and now to the end of 1980. Um, and my choice of university at that stage came back to bite me in the ass at a later stage. So I'll explain that. Um, I wanted to do law. Um, I had written the entry uh, exams and so on to get in. And my, my marks were good enough uh, to go and I'd been saving money. And um, but I thought I'd saved enough. That's another story. Um, anyway, so I resigned. Um, everyone was quite amazed that all of a sudden, you know, somebody who's such an enthusiastic Special Forces soldier is going to resign. I said, no, I want to go studying. Um, I thought I'd never come back here again. And that was what I said to myself, not to anybody else. And I left at the end of 1980. And I went to the University of Advantageland, or WITS, as it's called. Um. I found it was quite a um, social upheaval for me in a way. And you now all of a sudden exposed to things which you hadn't been before. Because in those days, um, we were fed a lot of propaganda that we didn't know. The government of the day were trying to control it and keep a lid on everything and so on. And all of a sudden, I was exposed to people called communists. I was exposed to the UDF, which was the forerunner of the ANC youth wing in those days because the ANC was a banned organization. On top of that, we had various other organizations there. We had the Black Sash, who were supporting people in, in the Black people in South Africa. And um, juxtaposed to that, we had a whole lot of old Rhodesians that had come down there. And the Rhodesians were always in short pants and short sleeve shirts and so on like that. And uh, you could recognize them. And then on the other side, we had the militant young black guys. And then in the middle, you just had studious people who wanted to do their things. And then we had a few reggae people as well, uh, who were just there to have fun. And, you know, mommy and dad were paying a lot of money for them to go and do their thing. And we had a big group of them. That's just all they wanted to do. I nearly completed the year, but my funds were running out. And I had written three of my five exams. And I was told um, by the council that I couldn't write the rest of my exams until I paid up, and which I couldn't do. I said, well, I'd like to. I'm going to be working this fact coming up, and then I can pay you back with by the end of December. And they said, no, you've got to go. And it was a bit of pill for me to swallow because there were a lot of young people there, majority of them being black, who were given the pass on that. And they did not have to pay their fees, but they were allowed to write the exams. And I, I was feeling very unhappy about it. I need to tell you that I'm, I'm not going to say what I did feel and how I'd express it. And it's strange at that stage that guys from um, Reconnaissance Regiment just happened to come around to come and visit us just to pay us a visit and see how we're doing at that stage. Um, Mark Natilovitz was at university with me at that stage. And strangely enough, the day that the guys came around to visit us, there was a guy called James Tetra, who I know has been on this program before. Uh, and one or two other guys came to see us and they asked, were we happy? And I said, no, I'm not very really happy. And he said, well, you know, there's always a home for you if you want to go, if you want to go there. Mark wasn't very happy either. And um, so we were ripe for the picking again. And guess what? When I said to myself, I'm never going to go back. You know, that, 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 that strength as a soldier in terms of what you feel and what you're passionate about doesn't die. It doesn't go away. You know, that training that you've experienced and that camaraderie, you don't get that same camaraderie in, in the civilian street. You just don't get it. And those friends that you made, and they might not be the type of guy that you can go and have a party with and go and have a braai or a barbecue with over weekends, 
But those are your friends, and you know you can count on them. You don't get that in Siffy Street. Anyway, went back to uh, Wanreki. Mark stayed on, uh, not at Wanreki. He went through um, the Special Forces HQ and ended up going to do operations with Renamo in northern Mozambique, which I did at a later stage. I went back to Wanreki. Um, and I was very happy to go back. Um, I'd missed out on Operation Kasselich and another operation which had uh, taken place, two big operations, but I got thrown in on the deep end and we had operations coming out of our ears. Um, during the course of my military career, uh, whilst at one recce, I was injured twice uh, during operations. And then when I was at two recce, which was a citizen force regiment, I was injured again, which was in Firewood. Uh, but that didn't deter me, nevertheless. But I also resolved at that stage that if I was going to go back to the Defence Force, I was not going to let my um, my career outside the Defence Force uh, or Special Forces um, suffer as a result of that. And I registered with uh, UNISA, the University of South Africa, to, con to continue studying. So I continued uh, with my course in law that I was going to that I was doing. It made it very difficult because all of a sudden now I'm busy with operations, traveling all over the place, and the whole time I've got books with me and notes and things like that. And and I got most of my assignments in. I wouldn't say I got all of them in on time, but they understood. And anyway, so that's what happened. Um, and I stayed on at Wanreki up until a certain point where I had completed um, the team leaders course. I was very unhappy at that stage because I... I scored the highest uh, highest marks in our team leaders course. We were quite a large group. We were 18 of us. Now, normally, you've got to be the rank of sergeant or above to do the team leaders course. Um, and that's really what you would do if you're going to go to infantry school to do the same. They just don't do, they don't cross the T's and dot the I's if I, in, in, in colloquial terms. Um, and I was told that I had failed. Now, remember, I mentioned WITS and the choice of university and coming to bite you in the ass. Well, this is where it came back, because everybody thought that I was not suitable um, senior NCO or officer material at that stage. And um, so I was failed. I was told by our course instructor, I'm not going to mention the name, he was a captain at that stage, he said you'd failed. Now, of course, you have interviewed a number of series, a guy called Esri Furi. Now, Esri was my my friend and uh, colleague and um, operat uh, operations buddy as well for, uh, for a long time. And he and I both scored the same marks on the course. His um, practical was one point higher than mine. My theory was one point higher than his. And we came in about like a 97% average. And yet I was told that I failed. And there was another officer who was on the course and he came on 32%, but he passed. Now, explain that to me. Um, and I was told that sorry, you have failed. And I said, no, I'm not accepting this. I said, how come? And he said, no, in the height of battle, your voice doesn't carry. Now, the course is quite a long course. Um, and you, you work with recruits, you work with youngsters, you involved in operations, you do a whole lot of things. So you are assessed over a period of time, a lot of theory, a lot of practical work to do, uh, working as individuals and also in teams. And, and it's very comprehensive. Um, anybody who's been on a course like it will know. Uh, and I knew that I'd done well. I fought hard for this, and I was told that I failed. I said, no, I'm not accepting it. He said, well, that's it. You have to accept it. I said, no, I don't have to. I mean, I want to see the commanding officer. So I went to go to see the commanding officer. I went on orders. It's very seldom that a guy like that demands say, I want to go and see the commanding officer. I'm going on orders. Then I went in to go and see our then commanding officer, and I'm not going to mention the name either. Um, and when I sat down, he wanted to know, in my own words, what it was. He knew what it was. Um, and I said, I did exceptionally well on that course. I scored as high as the next best uh, candidate on the course. Um, he passed and I failed. And why? And um, he repeated the same thing. I said, no, sorry, that doesn't wash with me. At that moment, he was called out of the office. And there was an operation on the go. And he said, I'll be back now, just wait. So I sat in the office and there sitting like a very big carrot on the top of his desk was my file. So I reached over the desk and opened the file and written in pencil, diagonally across on the inside, 
was written there in Afrikaans, beware, he's a communist. Pass up, he's a communist. Now, going to Wits University was where there were a lot of communists. Remember, I mentioned that early on uh, in the video. Um, but because of that, they immediately assumed that's what I was and what I was doing. And it came back also to me because when we were on the, mine, on the team leaders course and we'd been doing this section on security, I kept on asking questions about things that a lot of the current guys were not aware of, but having been outside, you exposed to all this stuff. And I kept on asking questions and asking questions. And um, I was called aside by um, a senior Lieutenant Colonel uh, one day during a tea break. And he said, you're gonna stop asking these questions. I said, why? He said, because you're embarrassing us. I said, but it's the type of thing you want to know if you're gonna be operating in an environment and that information is of vital importance, why are you stopping? He said, you just got to stop asking these questions. And this was at a time now in the early 80s, this was 83. Um, I think South Africa is coming under pressure. I think the government at that stage didn't know how to handle things. And I think even less so the Defense Force and Special Forces. Anyway, so I sitting in the office, I put the, I closed the file, pushed it back to where it was. The commanding officer came back in and um, he said, I'm finding it very difficult to uh, pass you on this course. I said, well, so if you don't pass me on this course, which I deserve, I am going to go to the general officer commanding uh, of special forces. I will go and see him. And if that's not going to be good enough, I will go to the press. So begrudgingly, he signed off my pink slip and passed the course. And I realized then that I had an issue because I thought if I were making the military my career, I'm certainly not going to do it as an NCO. I want to do it as an officer. Um, so I then went back within a week on orders again. And he said, what's this now? I said, I want to go to Otsu and I want to go and do um, the, uh, the bridging course so I can complete as officer's course. Um, so I think they were only too happy for me to go because they didn't know what to do with me. I then worked a bit with Jack Kreef in the interim uh, with small teams um i had worked there um in an officer in, in, a, in an instructor capacity i'd worked in uh training in mountaineering and rock climbing um that was about the only area of expertise that i had outside anything else um that i could add value to um and at this stage it was like uh, i felt like i was treading water and then when i got the opportunity to go to oats run um, i thought it was great i went there did what i need to do the six month period and came back. Um, and well, let me just put it this way. Um, I then tendered my resignation at one Reiki and decided I was going to leave. Um, they didn't want to uh, promote me from candidate officer to officer. And I decided then I'm not going to stay on. Um, and I left and I came up to Johannesburg. I had written an aptitude test with a company called Van Salem Pritchard. Uh, in those days, from Santa Pritchard were the top or leading guys when it came to computer programming. And I thought I wanted to do something great. Um, and um, so I'd been accepted by IBM, in fact, in those days. And I came up to Johannesburg uh, to join up with IBM. And the day that I joined IBM, IBM disinvested from South Africa. <laughs> but that's not, that's not what I'm here talking about. When I came to Johannesburg, within two days, the commanding officer of Tureki, which was then um, Commandant or Lieutenant Colonel Sabi von der Spey, had gotten hold of me via my father. And he said, um, come, my boy, you're coming over to Tureki. Um, and I spent another seven years at Tureki. Um, we were operational already all the time. South Africa was going through really um, tough times at that stage. And in those days, before cell phones, we had pages. We had normal phones and we worked like one of those uh, networks that uh, was used by the communist cells all over the world so that you knew the next person, the next person knew the next person. And we could arrange a call up. So if somebody phoned us and they said, you need to be at our HQ uh, within four hours, we could phone all of the guys. We were operational ready, have our kid ready, and then be at the Tureki HQ within a four hour period. And we did a lot of training um, and the guys were then uh, utilized by the other regiments, which was at that stage, four Reiki and five Reiki and one Reiki uh, as a pool or, of resource to draw upon um, when times are needed. 
So it meant that you had to be uh, au fait with the latest uh, trends in terms of training, uh, latest technology, whatever else was happening. And the more you utilized, the more you were used. And that happened. So I was seconded to five recce, did uh, some operations with them um, in various uh, capacities, which I really enjoyed. And then in 87, we were called up and we went to participate in Operation Firewood, which is another story entirely. Um, and I need to say that Operation Firewood knocked the wind out of my sails for a while. Um, I don't think you expect that type of thing to happen, you know, to me, you know, me being injured and so on. And I think it's not, it's, no, it's not an ego thing. I think it's a confidence thing, but I think it's also coming back into the fold. And I need to say that it took me a while, I would say about six months. And I think it's because you're in civilian street, you're not in a, in a military base, you're not in a military setup and you don't have your, your uh, comrades around you who are going to support you in that thing. You're very much on your own. And it must have taken me about a year and a half because before I felt ready again. And I stayed on with uh, Turek until they closed in 1991. So that's the end of my military career. But, um, you know, old soldiers never die. And that's funny. So through the Special Forces and through the friends I've made over the years, um, I was part of and instrumental to uh, the estab establishment of the Special Forces uh, association uh before that it was the um i can't even remember what it was called but the earlier forerunner of the special forces association and i was chairman of one of the groups which is here in johannesburg uh, which is called fort hunter they were all called forts based on our military uh setup that we had in special forces all around so we had fort hunter where i was based for a while um and chairman for and I really enjoyed that. I mean, sometimes politics and other things come to play, but it's very good in terms of supporting the older guys. And, you know, the guys are starting getting a bit older. They and their families also need help at certain times and not necessarily just financial support. They need moral support. They need, you know, they need friends. They need uh, guidance or whatever there. So that was part and parcel of that and just to feel valued because some people fall on hard times some people end up being isolated through circumstances divorce death or whatever it might be um and so i am an active member still with uh, fort hunter um, we've got a large group of people and strange enough under who mark natolovitz again which is really a great thing so that's quite nice and um, a lot of the old guys that we see on a regular basis and we're there for funerals and for weddings and to support the kids who are going through difficult times um and to add to that i recently became uh, a moth uh, for those who don't know moth is member of the order of tin hats so i perpetuate and follow in my father's footstep my father was in world war ii in the air force who served in uh, north africa and italy uh, he was a moth, and now I'm a moth too at the uh, steel helmet shell hole here in Parkhurst. And you know what? A lot of people say, well, you're an old fuddy-duddy, you're a veteran or so on. No, it's got nothing to do with that. I think it's got to do with your value system. Um, I really appreciate that. And those are people from all walks of life in military, uh, whether the Air Force, Army, whether you were a chef or whether you were just a troublemaker, it doesn't really make a difference. Um, but for me, that's an important component. And you know, I, I cut short my military career because I didn't see an opportunity for me being an officer because they did not see the value in me. But I've been a soldier through and through for most of my life. I would say at least for 40 years. Um, yes, I'm not an active soldier anymore, but I still support the values. I support fellow soldiers. I support what we stood for in those days and we still stand for that you know maybe our country that our government of the day doesn't support us but we support our country and we support our fellow members and i think that's an important component so that's it from my side i want to say to you this is a fantastic story to sit and listen yet i uh i would urge everybody please if there's one thing you you guys can do is go out and join the mobs Join the associations, get your beret back, join the parades, take pictures of it, make videos of it, and I will definitely try to broadcast that for you. 
Because once you sit alone, that is where you're going to get into trouble. Get back to your own people. But for you, I want to ask a question, Greg. Do you think, and I must say, I think you, the way you were treated is disgusting. Was it because you were English and Brits or Brits and perhaps not English? Or did they play a role, both of them? Look, if my surname was Potgieter, or something else rather than Ashton, um, I think would have made a difference because you, initially that is the first thing that you are assessed by um, your surname in many respects. So I think, yes, it does. Uh, strangely enough, on part of my mother's side, some of them were members of the Osova Brandwach. So if anybody wants to go back and ever go and have a look what they were, they were extremists and they supported uh, the people who were against the Union of South Africa and they... Um, and they were very pro-German in those days. They didn't like the Brits um, and the allies that um, were trying to fight against the Germans. So it's very pro-Boer in, in many respects, and that's where it comes from. And I think out of that came the Bruderbund, which was just the, the, the Afrikaners who were there to support and to drive the nationalism and, and survival and success of the Afrikaner. I think that's one. The fact that I went to Witz University, which, which was like the uh, uh, the home of communism, or so they thought, I think it was just the cherry and the cream on top. And obviously those two put together was just one of those things. Little knowing that in fact, it gave me a lot more capacity and capability in terms of being wise and in terms of being able to do other things. But, you know, um, those are the times. It's different to today. And if you were to use that as your as a positioning statement today, people would laugh at you because, you know, the mind post has moved long beyond that today. So it's, it's not of any relevance in any, in any way whatsoever. I felt that when I got to university, what they were very open to discuss things. I don't know how they are today, but... Really, things which we would never have discussed, even privately, they were openly talking about and debating with each other. And I think there's some kind, there's some kind of intelligence officer who's just gone mad. Uh, well, you're the only one, Greg, who, who who got treated by the system like this. No, there were, of course, there were a few others that I've come to learn with time that were like that. And it's strange that I think um, I know some officers whether they were English speaking at all or not, didn't make, really make a difference. But I think through the other um, arms of the of the Defense Force uh, or SNDF, had the opportunity to go and and and, and uh, do the officer's course and uh, progress in terms of their military career. I just think in my circumstance, and I know one or two others in, in a similar situation as mine, also decided that they were not going to stay on because they were castigated and they were put into a box and they were not deemed suitable for uh, what special forces uh, stood for in those days. But would you have picked up something amongst your mates or the teams themselves? Or was this just from the headquarters that was being funny? I, I think it filtered down, if, if, I, understand your, if I understand your question correctly. Um, I think it was... I think it was a standard that was set to maintain and this is what needed to be done and this is how you deal with it. And I think that was the standard that was applied and how um, the, how they just executed it. And I don't think there was much thought that went on to that. You know, not once um, did I have a discussion regarding my career. I talked to one or two of the officers and I'm going to say some of the Afrikaans speaking officers who were there. They were called in um, and their, um, either their team leader or their group leader or even the commanding officer called them in and said, well, you know, uh, young sir, young officer, um, we'd like to be able to utilize you in this way or that way. And we think this is where your strengths lie or this is where your weaknesses are and you need to go on such and such a course or you need to build this up. So there was career path planning. There was nothing like that for me. Um, I was never even considered in that uh, in any way whatsoever. And maybe it's because it was the early days then. 
um, special forces in South Africa or reconnaissance commander was still relatively small. I mean, when I did my selection course and came in, we were under 50. Um, my operator's badge number says number 302. Uh, that's got nothing to do with it. They were just issued randomly at a later stage. Um, so numbers got nothing to do with the sequence in terms of when you were in the regiment. Um, but I certainly think in those days, a lot, not a lot of that was given attention to. But I know some people who'd actually been counseled and told this is the career path we're planning for you. This is what we would like for you. This is where we're going to go and so on. So I, I think it was an us and them scenario in certain ways. And I'm just saying that now because you asked me the question. I never felt it, though, but retrospectively afterwards, I think that there was uh, there was a difference in the way some people were treated. You know, that, that's all that I can say. Look, I wasn't always the model officer. I need to tell you that, um, officer or soldier. I mean, in many ways, I was, I was called a civvy. I mean, I, I have a passion for radio. And I remember going on long operations where we were working with UNITA. What did I have in my backpack, which nobody else had? They might be carrying booze or something else. What I have, I had a portable radio with me. Because up in the bush, you could do things with it. You could pick up things. I remember in one particular instance where the Soccer World Cup was on, I made a fortune. When I say fortune, beers and cold drinks and booze because all the Portuguese um, people in the area wanted to listen to the World Cup. And I said, sure, you can bring it along, but it's going to cost you a six-pack of beer or whatever. And I had more beers and more booze than anybody else. But I got criticized for having a radio. But I knew what was going on in world news and current affairs and things like that. But... And I was, I was told by one officer that's not really uh, soldier-like to have that. But, you know, hey, we're all different in our own ways. Yeah, I have to laugh about that because what's worse now, you with your little processor radio, or the guy was actually switching the main radio on the vehicles onto 702 or whatever to listen to what's happening back up. Mm -hmm. This is the most, uh, the most stupid move. It's obviously the guy, you know, leaving the frequencies. The military frequencies, so you know some people. But I'm glad I got you here, Greg, because you were there when the Rhodesians arrived, uh, the SAS men, when they got down south. That's correct, yes. And a lot of Rhodesians actually do look at legacy. And a lot of them had a lot to say about what some of your colleagues had to say about them. I'm not getting involved there, but I want to ask you a straight question. Were the Rhodesians given a fair chance when they arrived? No, they weren't. Um, you know, that, just, that was handled badly, in my opinion. And yes, I was low, lower ranking um, NCO at that stage. I think I was only the rank of, um, of sergeant at that stage. Uh, but you're not part of the decision-making process. And how they were integrated when they came down um, and how they were made to feel welcome and what people did um, didn't all go well for them. They, they were not made to feel welcome. Okay, I also need to say that, you know, we met up with the uh, Saluskas and the SAS long before we'd actually worked with them. When I was doing my basic uh, cycle courses, we had a lot of them who came down and, and did courses with us, um, primarily uh, in demolitions um, and in communications and one or two other things like that. Uh, so we had guys who came down and spent time with us so when we went up and we were there, we met up with a few of them. We weren't given um, the, the red carpet treatment, um, although we, we were seconded to and we were part of the SAS. Um, we weren't issued, issued berets and stable belts. Uh, we just had the normal fatigues that they were issued with. And we got on and did the job. Not that we were there to be glory boys or anything like that. It was a different scenario because we were there helping them. And, and, you know, the Parabats also did the same. They were also working with the religion army at one stage and they went up there. So it's very much get on and get the job done. It was a different scenario uh, when Rhodesia fell um, and they needed uh, a helping hand. And I remember working with some of the uh, flights, the uh, C-130 flights, which flew out of Salisbury uh, back to South Africa. They needed one or two guys on there and I was on one or two of those flights. Uh, helping helping the guys get settled on board. And, you know, they brought down as much as they could. They let, left a lot behind. Um, and then they were brought down. So 
um, the guys from the Sulus guys ended up going to join up with Five Recce. And I think the integration went fairly smoothly. I think there were still hiccups, uh, but it was easy in a certain way. Um, and that's just my outside assessment of it, because from what I saw and years later, working with the guys from Five Recce, uh, it was fine. And even up until recently on a number of issues where we were dealing with some people, there were some of the old Salute Scout operators who were now Five Recce, and for them, it was um, it's like just moving house in a way. When the SAS came to join um, Reconnaissance Regiment, they were seconded to, or they created six recce for them to move into. So they were treated differently. Now, yes, the, the way that they operated when you were in the bush and the British influence on um on the old Rhodesia was a lot stronger and stricter than it had been on, on the South African Defence Force where the Boers had taken it and, and we had changed it and made it our own. And there was still some British heritage, but it was minimal. In the British, in the British system, and influence on the SAS was a lot stronger. Um, obviously, none of them spoke, or very few of them spoke any Afrikaans. There were quite a few South Africans with them, though. But they were just not integrated and made to feel welcome. Yes, there was a, a difference in some ways. And I think, I'm not saying they certainly were not the enemy, but there were differences. And some people came down, I'm sure they used the opportunity as a meal ticket to get out of uh, Rhodesia, then to get down here. And they weren't going to stay long because a lot of them then moved on and they went and joined up with Ron Reed Daly in the uh, Transkai Defense Force um, and things like that. Um, but a lot of them stayed on and a lot of them were successful um, and so on. Uh, and I'm sorry that it didn't go the way that it could and should have done. I think there was a bit of pride on the South African side. I think a lot of the older operators saw an us and them scenario and felt that these guys didn't really deserve it. But, you know, if instruction comes down, it's like in your own family, you know, things happen and you have to accept what's going to happen. Whether you like it or not, that's the way it will be and this is the way you'll deal with it. Um, that was never um, expressed or conveyed to us in terms of how it should have been done. Had that been done, I think the integration would have been a lot more successful. And I think instead of creating a separate um, regiment like Six Recce, if they just created... Uh, a Charlie group. So you've got Alpha, Bravo and Charlie or Delta and made them part of it. It would have been a far better integration uh, process. And I think the success rate would have been a lot higher, but that's just my take on it. You know? Yeah. We had the same problem in the police because we're recording a, a railway police special task force commander right now, Andre Willifir. And uh, these were very well-trained people, very, very well-trained. In fact, I think they worked with you people at uh, Durban when they came back from Israel. And when the two forces became one again, the railway police and the SAP, uh, they didn't know what to do with this unit. It was absolutely great at uh, rescues of hostages. And so they had to redo the selection. And as far as I understand, what happened was then is the SOP people just tried to break it. Mm -hmm. They humiliated in the process until their own officer said, enough, we're walking out of this nonsense. And that whole unit was lost. And you know what? It's just plain silliness, plain, plain stupid. But I want to ask you a last question, please. When your friend Daryl O'Kelly called me for a firework exercise, uh, he mentioned Tureki, and I have to admit to my shame, I didn't even know what Tureki was. <laughs> Can you tell me about Sibi, Sibi van der Spey, your commanding officer there, who's unfortunately now late? We hope you rest in peace from Sibi. And the culture of Tureki, was it completely different from one Reki who was like the main operational unit at that stage? Yes, it was. Tureki came, came out of um the desire to set up a special forces um special special forces regiment now at the same time um you had colonel jan breidenbach and the dirty dozen who were setting up 
um, reconnaissance commander in those days and was come out of Otswin. So you had the guys from the Otswin who were permanent force soldiers, but now you had guys who were citizen force uh, who had time on their hands, they had skills, and they wanted to do something else. So the initial foray into that is what was called the hunter group. And if you look at the old hunter group logo, it's a scorpion. And that scorpion later on in terms of the badging for Tureki was carried through on that. And the, the Tureki logo then incorporated the scorpion. Um, the hunter group, they had a lot of guys who came, um, I wouldn't say World War II, but there were guys certainly influenced from World War II, gee, sounds like I'm giving my age away now, but these, these are people a lot older than me. Um, and a lot of them were also members who had been involved in the in Operation Savannah. Um, I think of people like Brian Walls, uh, Willie Ward, people like that. Um, and they had been involved uh, in Operation Savannah, which for those who don't know was when South Africa went into Angola in 1975. Uh, and with the support and the backing of the uh, Americans and the CIA. And then when they got in there and they were close to Angola, all of a sudden that support and uh, uh, the motivation behind the Americans just sort of fell away at that stage and uh, South Africa was left very much on their own. A lot of the operational people were working with in those days, which was called the Bravo Group. And, you know, so you're talking about Willie Ward, uh, Willie Ward, the late Willie Ward and Brian Walls and a few others. And after Operation Savannah, they came back. So here you had guys who had military experience, could be utilized, and they were both then um, in the what then moved from the Hunter Group to, to Reiki. Because whilst um, the Hunter Group was doing, or trying to do what the early Reiki group were doing or Reikis were doing um, out of Otswin. And I stand corrected under this because I'm in terms of the timeline, I think they, they were, they were running parallel to each other in terms of synchronization. I don't know exactly where it happened, but I know that at one stage, Sabi von Spey, who was then a major, I think he was captain first and then major, who was actually a civil engine, uh, a, a mechanical engineer, if I'm correct, um, in, in his civilian capacity, was then approached by Defense Force headquarters and said, you know, you've got these guys, maybe we could utilize them. Maybe like the Rhodesians had a territorial force, we could, if we got guys who come out of, um, out of uh, reconnaissance regiment and then later on one Ricky, uh, four and five Ricky, what are we going to do with them? We don't want to lose that expertise. So if we then create two Ricky, we can put them in, keep them trained up, keep them skilled and utilize them we've got a, a, a better um, resource at our disposal. And that's what happened. So uh, Sabi von Spey uh, went through the whole process. He, he did the diving course. He did the selection course, did like, like everybody else. A small, wiry, tough man with a warped sense of humor. I really loved him and as tough as nails. He was just one of those great guys. And he, as a commanding officer to Ricky, I mean, I know you talked to Stan Botten about various things, but Sabi von Spey was really a good leader. And he was the type of guy who would grab you and come and sit down, but, you know, have, have, have a, a rum and a Coke with him and talk about things. But if you got on the wrong side of him, you know, he would meet out the punishment. And then shortly thereafter, everything's fine. We can go back to normal again. Uh, and he was good. And, um, his expertise was later on used uh, with a company called EMLC. EMLC was a specialist engineering company which was contracted in by the Special Forces uh, uh, to produce uh, special weaponry equipment and things like that. So a lot of the stuff we use later on, and I would say 79, 80, 81, all the way through, was equipment that came out of EMLC. Sabi knew what was required and it kept him closer to the guys, but he was also focusing on other things. And he was just one of those great guys. He had, he was dynamic in a certain way. He was small um, in stature, but he just was larger than life. He was just a great guy. Uh, and so that's the parallel between the two. And that's the way that it worked. And I think it was the right thing to do. Um, and we even end up with some guys like from, um, 32 battalion who ended up not having a place to go to one of the, one of the young guys that you interviewed, Justin Taylor, 
was with us for a while. Um, and, you know, he had, he'd finished off his national service at 32 Battalion. They didn't have anywhere else to place him. And he was with us for a while. So that's just the way I suppose that it worked. I just want to make sure you got this pager. And then, of course, you would get paged and you get your mates together and go out to operations. How do you explain that to your wife or girlfriend or even your mom? Okay, let's put it in context. So this is when early days of Turek, before the days of cell phones. So um, I was working as a sales rep for a company. So I had briefed the company already to tell them that this was what could or would happen in the event of uh, being called up if there was a, uh, a message which came through a phone call and said, you have to report now. Um, this is what would happen. And I had the support of my... Uh, managing director and the chairman of the of the company I was with, uh, they were very supportive of the war effort in those days. Um, I wasn't married in those days yet. I had a girlfriend though, but I briefed her and I said, "This is what's going to happen." And unfortunately, it's just the way things are. You need to accept it, and that was just part and parcel of me. You you can't not do so because you've got some of your equipment at home, so you've got some of your your, your kit, when I say your kit, your backpacks and some of your other stuff, because you had some of that with you because you needed that quickly. But all your armaments and everything else and stuff that you needed, you would draw on from stores when you went there. And that's the way that worked. Um, you know, you, you, you can't um, live like uh, Dick Tracy or James Bond and just, you know, disappear. No, we live in a real world and you have to be able to do that. And, you know, I, I think the same thing happened in Rhodesia. It happened in any other country where people are on standby and that's the type of thing that happened. So I suppose as big boys, that's just the way we do it. Do you have any advice for somebody who's listening here who are thinking of joining the army? Any army doesn't need to be the South African one. Strange enough, I had the call from somebody else the other day and said, uh, his son wanted to, to join up because he wanted to get a qualification. Um, uh, and um, I said to him, yeah, I think it's going to be a bit difficult uh, in South Africa at the moment. Uh, look, there are still opportunities, but I see now that the minimum entrance is you've got to have a matric. In other words, you've got to have completed your high school. Um, if you want to join up with special forces, you need to have done your basics in, I think, a year or maybe two years in, in some infantry regiment um, in the South African National Defense Force before you can apply and go through the selection uh, process, if you wanted to do that. Um, if it were me today, no. I, and strange enough, when I was talking to someone the other day, they said, you know what, go to Paris and join the French Foreign Legion. And I know a lot of a lot of guys that I know who've, whose sons have gone there, or they have gone on holiday there and they said, guess what, my boy, we've got a present for you. And they go to the front gate there and they actually drop them off. I know three cases like that where that has happened. And in, 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 in all three cases, the guys ended up, because you've got to do a selection uh, uh, process that you have to go through. You have to learn to speak basic French. Um, and then you get through and with time, you know, you get better at that. I know other people who've either gone to um, the Australian uh, army, if you can get into Australia. I think the UK is easier. I know a lot of people have gone there. And I want to know one or two have gone to the US to join up with the Marines. And one of them actually went through um, the military academy as well. So if you want to make it a career soldier, Sadly, I don't think we have the makings and capabilities really in South Africa to do that, unless you wanted to go to special forces. Um, but even then, I can see the guys who are doing operations at the moment are stretched to capacity, and things aren't what they used to be anymore. Um, it, it is quite different, but if you are willing to do that and you don't want to leave um, the safety net of mommy and daddy and being here in South Africa, you can. And safety net, I say in parentheses. Um, but I think the opportunity is bigger and better abroad. And that's my take on it. Thank you for that. I have to say, I have a nephew who actually did exactly that. He joined the foreign legion and uh, ended up in Corsica at the Parachute Regiment. Wonderful guy. 
probably still working for France. I know after six years you get citizenship. And one thing about the Legion is I do take care of my people very well. Afterwards, I have like uh, farms. And if you've ever been in the Legion and you're on hard times and you can get yourself to a farm, many of them, they do wine there or something. And you'll be taken care of just because you were in the region once. It's it's really really touching to see, but of course it's such a famous unit and it's much smaller than would have been an entire army. Mm-hmm. That's what I have to say that. But we've come to the end of this one now. I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of questions. So please leave them below here. Yeah? And if your people have a story to tell or you think you do, and then normally you do, or even if you think you don't. Come and talk to me. It's it's important that we get these history lessons, you know, down so that those following us can come and listen to you and they can decide themselves what happened in the old days. So I don't think the history books are really going to tell you much. Uh, history, I've written a few books myself, is written with a certain object. And it is for Victor who writes the history books, so I guarantee you that. So until we meet again, God bless.